for everyone who's uh, been here before or who has not, uh, my name is Josh Gregory. I am the director of our consulting and training teams here at Route Consultant. Uh, and I, you know, I, I was a broker before that. I've been here uh, for a number of years working on both uh, with both buyers getting into the space and with sellers trying to find the best way to optimize their businesses. Um, but for everyone else, for all of our regular attendees who have been here before, whether you are brand new and this is your first time ever uh, getting into one of these webinars, or if you've been here for a decade or ever are all since the RPS days, we still want these webinars to be a place for everyone to come together, learn hopefully, uh, and ask some questions so that we can make sure we're all kind of working together as a contractor community. Now, uh, before I get started, I do have to read a quick disclaimer. Uh, so Route Consultant is not endorsed by and is not recommended by Federal Express Corporation, FedEx Ground, or Amazon. Route Consultant is not sponsored by, is not approved by, is not associated with, and has no connection whatsoever with Federal Express Corporation, FedEx Ground, or Amazon. Uh, so all that means is that we are not going to be sharing any materially non-public information here, uh, but we do want to make sure, like I said, that we are providing some helpful information where we can all come together and learn. So um, a little bit later, I will bring on the co-host. Uh, she is one of the amazing consultants on my team, Anna Childers, and she has she also has experience um, working at, on the FedEx side as a driver as well. So I'll bring her in a little bit later as we get into the Q&A, and so you can all meet her if you haven't before. So let's see if I can avoid some technical difficulties. Um, you might have to deal with a little bit of stuttering if that continues, but for now, uh, <laughs> hopefully I'm, I'm back on top. Can't control everything with technology. It just seems that it is an isolated effect. So today, uh, what I want to talk This is an industry where a lot of your success boils down to managing your people and managing your trucks. So today, I wanted to, what I wanted to do is spend a little bit of time going over the key points. Uh, and then if, if we have time, a couple of main guiding principles that I want you to keep in mind when you're planning out your repair and maintenance strategy. So the first and most important is that any time down the line. So there need to be behaviors to promote those ideas and a culture that you create on your team where everyone understands drivers to understand that it is important to be uh, to not be lazy when it comes to staying on top of maintenance. So and, and that's all comes back to why basically the single most important action that your driver is going to do every morning when they come into the terminal is to do a pre trip inspection of their vehicle. Um, now, this is a requirement for every driver, but it's also just a good business practice. Um, hold on. I think we're, let me see if I am, yeah, I think I'm still cutting in and out a little bit. So you might just have to bear with, uh, I'll, I'll try to talk more slowly. <laughs> and tell you and you don't do anything about it, you will be liable in the event of an accident. So it's really important that you're staying on top of it. And if they aren't doing this pre-trip inspection, or at least aren't doing it thoroughly, it really increases the chance of equipment failure or some kind of accident. And that can jeopardize the safety of your drivers, for one, but also everyone else on the road. Uh, so even if there's not an accident, you're going to be able to, you're not going to be able to finish that route for the day and you'll have to send someone else out to go pick up those packages. Uh, let me see. Uh, and then finish the day. Um, so when your driver returns at the end of the day, they also have to do a post-trip inspection. Uh, now these are scanner prompted. 
federal documents that your drivers are signing. So this should not be a casual activity that everyone takes lightly. This, this is just as important as the pre-trip that they're doing it at the end of the day. The post-trip is also critical because it will help you ensure that you detect any damage that was done to your truck overnight. Uh, believe it or not, the terminal will sometimes move your vehicles at night and sometimes they will damage your vehicles. So uh, you want that post-trip inspection that is time-stamped and shows that there were no issues when you left that truck that night, but now you have a broken mirror and I'm not paying for that fix. Um, and then the last thing around preventative maintenance that I just want you to know is that I would strongly recommend having some kind of fleet management software. It doesn't have to be a huge expensive platform, but you do need something that can be a working database to keep track of things like oil changes and brake pads and tire swaps, just a system to stay on top of that and remind you when all of those things are coming up. Um, now, preventative maintenance will only get you so far. So when those repairs do need to happen, it is crucial to have a few different vendor relationships set up in advance. Uh, and the first one of those is to have a good mechanic. So once you have gotten up to a larger size organization, you can justify having a full-time mechanic on staff. But even when you're smaller, your lead driver or your BC should be able to do minor repairs like, like bulb replacements or loose mirrors. Um, but even past that point, there will come a, a point in your contractor journey where you do need larger scale repairs. Hopefully it won't happen early, but it will happen. Uh, and unless your routes are less than 10 miles from the terminal, you should have relationships with two different mechanics. So you need to have one that is close to the terminal in case your truck breaks down close to the terminal. But you also should have one that is closer to your service area in case a truck breaks down on the road. Uh, the other thing you need to ask that mechanic, uh, and this applies to all of your maintenance vendors, is can they do on-site repairs uh, or can they do after-hour service uh, and ideally after-hour service on-site? Uh, because again, if your truck breaks down at the terminal, it is a huge win if the mechanic can come to the terminal to repair it so that you don't have to pay for a towing service. It's just extra cost to get it out to the shop. So ideally you have things like that set up in advance. Uh, and you're going to want to have the same types of conversations with a local towing company, a tire dealer, a decal installer, a body shop, a truck washing location. You need all of those. Uh, truck washes are something that people don't think about often, but it is a great way to keep FedEx happy with you because you are going to have the best looking trucks in the terminal. Uh, for all of those vendors, though, uh, again, like I said, ask about where they can service and if it can be after hours. But you also want to form real relationships with them so that you know that they're people and you know that they're vendors that you can trust. Uh, and I, ideally, you're going to check references on all of these um, from other contractors at the terminal. You will also want to try to negotiate advanced pricing when you can and if you can do on-demand service when possible. Because the last thing you want for all of these is for a truck to go down in your service area and you don't know which towing company will deliver in range or pick your truck up in range, it's too far away from your mechanic um, who's close to your terminal, and then you don't have any other options, so you end up paying someone, uh, you know, an arm and a leg for an emergency repair and an emergency tow. So it is critical that you are managing these relationships in advance if you want to control your repair and maintenance budget and have more predictable operations and expenses. Uh, the last piece of advice that I will give here is that all of this, if, if all of this sounds like a lot and you just want to avoid dealing with the repairs side of the business, there are full service leasing options for both P&D and line haul. Uh, there are a large number of vendors on the line haul side that do full service leases. So, you know, REL, Rolling Equity Lease, uh, Penske, Ryder. But for P&D, the main option is Hello Truck Leasing. Uh, so with Hellotruck leasing, you will get extensive telematics that are built into the vehicles from Ford uh, so that you can have all the data you want on what's happening underneath the hood. You'll also be able to have all of your repair and maintenance covered as a part of the lease payment so that your repair and maintenance is a set expense each month instead of having the up and down variable expense of repairs that come with owning a fleet of your own. Uh, those are three-year leases on all different types of vehicles. So 
Uh, again, for, for Hello Truck Leasing or any of the vendors that I've been kind of talking through and mentioning today, if you reach out to our team, we can connect you with the right contact or the right type of vendor there. So that is a really quick overview of running an effective repair and maintenance program and, and some tips there. So pre-trips and post-trips are non-negotiable and preventative maintenance is critical. You have to build those relationships with vendors around repair and maintenance. And all of these behaviors need to be routine that you build into your staff. Uh, and everyone needs to know it. It needs to be re-emphasized regularly. So any questions there that we can get to those in the Q&A. But before we get to the Q&A, I just wanted to quickly cover a new update around the VETR technologies that came out this past week. Uh, so VETR is Video Event Data Recorder. And those are basically a combination of a dash cam facing out of the vehicle and a camera that faces in at the driver. So that's all VETR is, just that two camera system. Um, and it is a requirement for all vehicles, P&D and line haul. It has been for years now. And there are currently four key indicators that you're required to be compliant with. Um, right now, those four key indicators are that the driver, the devices have to be connected and transmitting, is number one. You have to go in and associate a driver in the platform anytime there's a triggering event. You also have to coach drivers on coachable events like failing to wear their seatbelts or texting while driving. And then the last one is that the coaching you do has to be effective, so there can't be repeat events. So those are the four right now, and it's a part of the contract. But what was announced this week is that those four are changing to be four completely different metrics. Um, and these metrics are now gonna be more focused on driver actions, as opposed to these kind of business type functions that you do as an owner. So the new four key indicators are one, uh, distracted driving, which is using a cell phone while you're driving. Two is not wearing a seatbelt. Three is speeding 10 miles per hour over the speed, over the speed limit. And the last one is different for PND and line haul. For PND, the fourth one is failing to come to a complete stop. Uh, for line haul, it is following too closely to the car in front of you. So the following distance has to stay a certain amount. Um, so the way those four are going to work is that based on the size of your business, there's going to be a threshold, a certain number of violations that you can have in each uh, of those categories to be compliant. And it'll be reviewed monthly. And if you are out of compliance if any of any of those four, then it'll trigger a business discussion with FedEx about how you can improve that. Now, on the whole, this is actually a great change in terms of uh, the new things being tracked. Um, these are things your drivers should be doing anyway. And these are things that are a part of safe business operations that you should already be emphasizing and that you want to make sure they're doing. Uh, and additionally, some of the current ones, the current ones that are changing, the current key indicators can be a little bit finicky. Uh, in particular, the connectedness uh, standard requires you to turn on spare vehicles to make sure that they were connected every few days. And that can be really annoying. And if there's any uh, key indicator that I see people struggle with early, it's that one. So the fact that these are changing and it's more just going to be a focus on promoting safe practices for drivers is fantastic. Uh, so these are good changes, but I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of them. Um, they are rolling out on June 1st, so very soon. So uh, if, if that's something you have more questions on, I can point you to the, the details uh, of that in on my ground biz or share with you how it's going to look in the contract. Happy to answer any additional questions there, but wanted to make sure everybody knew about it. Uh, so that is what we'll cover today uh, in terms of content. So I will bring Anna back on as we get into the Q&A. And Anna, if if I'm still being a little bit choppy, should I come over there? Have I have I improved at all? I have improved, Josh. I think everything is resolved. So okay. looks good from here. <laughs> okay. So um, <laughs> if anyone has any outstanding questions, whether it be on repair and maintenance or VETR or anything else this week, feel free to submit those to the Q&A and we will go over any questions anybody has now. Um, and if not, we won't hold you here. So uh, if you've got questions, we'll answer all of them. But if not, we're not going to make you ask them. Oh, we have one. Um, David says, on some routes, I see trucks on an inventory list that are 20 years old, but are only listed with, say, 35,000 miles. What's going on here? And should I be afraid of this? Maybe. Uh, so what I would say is you are correct in thinking that that looks strange. Uh, there are reasons 
why it could still be a vehicle that's not as bad as the age makes it appear to be. Mm-hmm. But what you need is an answer. You need context on that. So um, I have seen a couple of things I've seen. One time I I, I knew a contractor who got, uh, uh, I, I think it was about 15 vehicles actually from the post office. Um, and they were normal delivery vehicles, but it was a part of a fleet that the post office never used those vehicles except for in peak season if they really needed it. So most of the time it sat there. But they were, you know, it's it's government, so they had a 10-year contract. So at the end of 10 years, they were forced to sell those vehicles, regardless of the mileage. And so he got them for really cheap, despite the oh, age. Wow. So sometimes there's reasons like that and things that can happen where it can be really old and have low mileage, and that's real. The other thing is that sometimes when people list mileage, they're actually uh, saying the mileage of, you know, maybe they had an engine replacement and reset the mileage. So that can happen too. So just make sure you know why that is. And as long as there's a valid reason, or at least uh, a justification you can understand and be comfortable with, that's fine. But it is, it is something that should be a question mark that you ask questions about. So that is, it is fair to ask and you should get, hopefully you get a good answer there. Uh, Know that there are, there are valid reasons for that. And then there are also just, um, you know, they might've just put the wrong mileage. So yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, definitely. Okay, Micah says, has anyone conquered how to handle rural rural routes with a relay station? Trying of thinking, thinking of trying different tactics with my fleet, but I would welcome your insight uh, from someone who has succeeded or failed in a similar situation. And, you know, there's a couple of different things here. Uh, so, Micah, the question I would have first is, are you currently running a relay station and running into difficulties, or are you trying to kind of consider it and this may be something, if it's something you're currently running and running into challenges, that's something we could talk about offline. That might be a further conversation. Uh, but in general, you know, relay stations work really the best, uh, not as much for rural, uh, but more for if you have a territory that's fairly dense, but just far away from the terminal. So that if you can set up the relay station in your territory, you don't have to drive very far from that relay station. If, if it's a rural territory uh, where even if you set up a relay relay station closer, but you still have to drive a ton of miles, it's not always extremely attractive. A relay station is not a one size fits all. So it may just be that that's something that maybe we could help with and talk through, but the answer may be that it it just might not be a territory that um, that works really well. Yeah. Micah says he he is currently running a successful relay, so. Okay, so yeah, so so it's it's great when it works. It's just, it, it doesn't always work for rural is what I would say. And so th- this may be more of a scenario, Micah, where if you reach out to the team, we can kind of, I, I'm, you know, I talk with contractors on a one-on-one basis like that all the time. So if there's something specific to the relay station you want to talk through, just reach out to the team. We can set up some time. Absolutely. Okay. Mike says, Josh, can you go in a little more in depth regarding line haul and starting a line haul business with FedEx? I've watched your, you guys' YouTube videos and you said that you could be helpful with things like the RFI. Yes. So um, I'll try to keep this not to an <laughs> hour long dissertation. <laughs> I'm a little bit more in depth regarding line hall. So yeah. I'll, I'll answer that that last part of it first. So uh, we, so my team is the consulting team and as a part of it, we do help uh, buyers who are going through the process, whether it's P&D or line hall, um, through every step of the process to help them acquire businesses. Um, so Part of that is RFI, preparing for the FedEx interview, uh, helping actually in the deal search phase and structuring that offer, whether it's through our brokerage or externally. Um, So that's the, when you hear us talk about white glove or consulting or acquisition strategy, we have a bunch of different names that you'll hear it called, but all of those really are the same program where our goal is to help guide buyers through that process from beginning to end all the way to a successful close. Now, so that's the, that's the short part. So uh, let's do a, a really short part, uh, you know, kind of overview of line hall, how it's different than P&D. And then if you have follow-up questions, feel free to ask them. So um, the, when you're thinking about the differences between line hall and P&D, P&D is there are lots of little things you deal with on an ongoing basis. There's much, much more operationally intensive because you're dealing with structuring your routes each day. You typically have far more drivers and trucks. Um, and you know, it's, it's kind of, you're always in the, in the weeds a little bit when it comes to P and D line hall is often, um, you know, 
there could be there are there are going to be multiple days where you don't do anything or where nothing bad happens. Your drivers are more of career drivers where you know they went through CDL school, they're getting paid very well. It's you're not going to have to really worry about people not showing up, and if, especially if you have all dedicated runs, which I'll go over that in a second. Um, you will have drivers that do the same run every single day where they start at the same location and finish at the low, same location and come back. Uh, and those can either be solos or teams. The solo runs are one driver. Team runs have two drivers. And typically those are much longer runs for the team runs because you have drivers that are alternating. So they go overnight. Solo runs typically will begin at around 8 or 9 p.m. and then come back in the early morning. Um, so they're typically just the you know about an eight to ten hour block of time that a solo run will run yeah um but it is very regular you've got drivers that um, know what they're doing there's not a lot you have to coach them on um they are not doing much besides interstate they're just going to a from a terminal to a terminal dropping off the the, the track the trailer and coming back so most of the time there's not a ton operationally but when things go wrong, it's more expensive. Um, repairs are much more expensive. Recruiting is your number one expense and challenge that you're always focused on. If you can recruit successfully, you will be successful in line haul. If you can recruit CDL drivers successfully, you will be successful in line haul. But um, that is the challenge, is continuing to make sure that your bench is filled and you can continue to grow in that space. Um, just a, a quick breakdown of what runs look like. So dedicated, I, I mentioned already, are basically runs where you know the origin and the destination, and they're very consistent. They run the same every day. Unassigns are basically the, the next step down in terms of consistency, where um, they're essentially the extra volume at the terminal, and there's a rotation among all of the unassigned runs at the terminal. So you know where you'll start, but you'll go to a different location every day. Uh, and the main thing you're trying to figure out when you're deciding um, on an unassigned location is uh, how consistent will you get volume? Most of them you will. And as long as it's got a little bit of history, you can tell how consistent it'll be. Um, and then there's also spot runs, which are a whole other uh, ballpark I, yeah, I could go into. But basically, just think about it as uh, a run that's very low mileage to a location like a Bass Pro Shop or a Chewy's that's close to the terminal that normally would have been done by a P&D contractor, but it, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense to send a P&D contractor out there because it would take them four or five trucks to get that one load. So they send a line haul contractor out to pick up those, come back. So really short overview uh, of line haul. You got to be able to continue to secure uh, drivers, that is your number one priority if you want to maintain and grow. Uh, and then it, it works differently in terms of scale versus PND. PND is you can be a certain percentage of a building. For line haul, you can be a certain number of runs in a district. There's 26 districts in the US. So as long as you're kind of within uh, under 15 runs per district, then you're within scale and you can keep growing. So uh, there's there's lots more than that, but that is a really short kind of overview there. And if you want to talk more or schedule more time, uh, reach out to, to the team. You can just do info at routeconsultant.com and we will get you set up um, and make sure that you are connected and uh, get all your questions answered on that. Because it is, it, you know, we have just barely scratched the surface with that answer is what I would say. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of information in a short amount of time. Our YouTube channel is another great place to, to find some basic line haul information as well. So uh, anonymous question um, about pay rates. We're currently doing day rates in an urban environment. Some are heavy business, some are heavy residential, most are a mix of both. Uh, day rates are rough on slow days for the contractor because you get four hours of work, but still pay a full day's rate. We've tried to cut routes on days, on certain days and ask others to take on more stops for a full work day. They complain like, heck, what's the best way to handle? <laughs> yeah. So. One of the tough things is if you're if you're currently doing day rates, which for us, we always found to be the most effective It incentivizes them to be done as quickly as possible. Um, hourly can, you know, there's a certain incentive to take longer. You get paid per hour, so it doesn't matter how quickly you deliver. Um, and pay per stop gets complicated and you can end up overpaying. Um, the, the challenge with day rates, for sure, is if you have a bunch of drivers that are used to only working four hours and have no ability or desire to work more than that. Um, and that can, be, that can be a tough transition. Sometimes that re requires coaching. Sometimes that requires driver 
uh, turnover and replacement to get the right staff in place. Uh, if it is something where you think they're capable and they're complaining, sometimes it can be a conversation where you sit down and say, you know, you're doing 130 stops a day. I need 150. If you can prove that to me over the next month, I will increase your pay by X amount. So there's those types of conversations with you that you can have. You can do it individually at the driver level. Sometimes um, it may be, you know, it just depends on your management style. Your BC may be able to have those conversations more effectively. Just look at the relationships and who can have those. And, and really what you're trying to figure out is which of my drivers are capable of getting there. I might just have to push a little bit with or, or give a little bit of an incentive. And then which of my drivers do I just know they're never going to improve so my job is to find a backup and a replacement so that I can change that payroll over and start to make changes there. Uh, because you will find if you can get the right hours, you should still shoot for seven or eight hours, especially in an urban area, trying to get there um, and improve the stop counts. If, you know, the other side of it is if your trucks are bulking out, if you're, if you're, you know, if you have too small of vehicles and so you can't get enough stops in the truck to do that number of hours, you might have to make some fleet changes as well. So a couple of things to think about there, but oftentimes the hardest thing is that sometimes it's just, I have to either make, I have to, you know, coach my team properly or incentivize them properly, or I have to make the hard decisions to replace them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another anonymous question, uh, with line haul and particularly with the dedicated runs, are the trucks typically day cabs or sleepers? Also, regarding consulting, do you have dedicated consultants for line haul opportunities? Um, so I'll, again, I'll start with the, the easy answer first. I'll do the second part. Uh, so we don't have consultants that are only focused on line haul. What we have, every single one of our consultants uh, are under understand and are able to coach on line haul and PND. What we find is that a lot of our consultants may think they want to do line haul or may think they want to do PND. And then at some point they end up switching or going after both. So it's best if if they know everything and instead of just siloing you into line haul, because it may be that your best opportunity actually ends up being in PD. So all of our consultants know everything. We don't want to lock anyone in saying, hey, you've bought line haul consulting. Now you can't go after PD. So if you if you enter our consulting program, we will help you successfully close on PD or line haul. Uh, now, when it comes to uh, tractor types, typically. If it's a solo, it is a uh, day cab. And if it's a, a team run, it's a sleeper. Team, the, the sleepers are more expensive. You really don't need it for a solo. The drivers aren't, although they're driving at night, they're not sleeping. They're, you know, their run starts late in the day and they do. There are AM runs as well, but I would typically not recommend um, paying for a sleeper cab when you're only doing solos. Right. That makes sense. You also should not get day cabs for your team runs. They will not be happy. <laughs> so, so make sure oh, you get speakers for your team runs. Yeah. in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, Micah has another question. Uh, does route consultant help contractors put their negotiation packages together when talking to engineering at FedEx, especially when it comes to data around unique circumstances or characteristics? What I'll say is when it comes to unique characteristics, um, it's really hard for us to actually do it for you because we just don't know the unique characteristics of your territory. But if you reach out to us, we help people all the time and, and helping to craft that story. It's more of advice and, and showing you how we've done it. So yes, if you reach out to the team, we can help you through that process. Definitely. All right, Eric wants to know, how do you quantify the risk uh, of the investment with how much power FedEx has, uh, both good and bad? Yeah, so I, you know, that's the that is your question. You're deciding as an investor, and I think it's it's more about understanding uh, what you can and can't control, and understanding how to stay in the right ballpark of in terms of what FedEx thinks is uh, the correct way to do things. So there may always be a more profitable way to do it, but at the same time, you should always keep in mind what FedEx thinks is the right way to do it. And typically, we found that. For most things, you should play in the sandbox that FedEx creates. And it's pretty easy to do that in most cases. What I, what I would say is that they are moving towards providing more data so that you know what they are judging you on. So the, the metal system, I've talked about it a couple of times, um, you know, it's not the most popular topic, but at the same time, FedEx has come out and said there will be a contractor facing data dashboard where you will have a you will be able to see the things that they are judging you on for those metals and things like that although you 
are at risk because FedEx is making certain kind of judgments and decisions. If they're moving in the direction where we have complete visibility to understanding the criteria and how you end up in each of the tiers, that's a good thing. That's that's where we can operate effectively as a contractor and make business decisions where we have full knowledge of how it'll affect us with FedEx. So what I would say from a, you know, the bad is that as a, as a entrepreneur, you always want full control over the, the wins and the losses. Um, but basically what you're doing here is you're partnering with FedEx and they're providing a lot of value. They're, you know, you don't have to do any marketing. You don't have to do any sales. They bring all the customers in volume, but with that come certain requirements and standards. And, you know, sometimes those standards are what can feel overly aggressive, but the more you understand them and play in the ballpark, the more you'll kind of find the right way to, to operate. So what I would say is it is, it is part of the risk, but it's also part of the value. It's, it, you know, that's, that's the, that is the good and the bad of this space is FedEx provides all of that value to you and you just have to operate effectively. Uh, the challenge is that they are, they have, you know, they have requirements that they ask of you and sometimes they can uh, be a lot. But now I think there's more of a movement towards making it clear what those standards are and leaving and kind of eliminating more of the gray areas. And that's a good step in the right direction. Yeah, it really is. It's interesting to see how things are changing over time. Yeah. Uh, we have another anonymous question. With the current macroeconomic concerns and all the additional costs and requirements from FedEx, what multiples are we seeing with P&D routes lately? Specifically yeah, I, times EBITDA, four times EBITDA. Yeah, so this will depend on uh, the brokerage, but with, with our listings, they're still trending in the same directions, kind of that four to four and a half multiple range, as high as five, especially in line haul, they still trend on the upper end. Um, it's less of a, it, it was more last year. We're still seeing some of it this year where we're seeing, you know, some of the margins are lower, but the multiples are still trading at the same level. So the overall price may be lower if the margins are slightly tighter but the multiples aren't changing and we don't really expect the multiples to change because that is if you think about what a multiple is that's four to five years in advance that they're expecting you to get that return on your investment and most people even the most uh the the most conservative projectors here are not expecting the any of these macroeconomic conditions to last more than you know a year to 18 months so when you're thinking about the the long run of an investment like this um, this the multiples haven't really been impacted too much. Right, right. Well, I think that's all for our questions right now. Perfect. All right. Well, we will, while I am talking for like the next 10 seconds, we will allow any last questions to come in. Otherwise, we'll let you go. But uh, just a reminder that I mentioned to everybody at the beginning, if you weren't here at the beginning, we do have a couple of upcoming events. First, if you are on the West Coast, if you are in San Diego, tonight there is a happy hour in San Diego that our team is at. And tomorrow we have a roadshow in San Diego where we are going over all the new technology changes, things like the work area planner you need to be aware of, DRO, everything that's going to impact things for the metals system. So if you're in the area, that roadshow is happening tomorrow and the happy hour is tonight. Uh, and the uh, those are free. Drinks are free. Drinks are included. Food's included. So all you have to do is get there. Uh, so if, if you're if you have questions about the location, just reach out to the team. We can send you the the uh, actual locations of everything. Uh, and then new investor summit coming up in the, in uh, the first week of March is our next one in person in Nashville. And the expo is coming in July uh, in Vegas. So if you haven't registered, go ahead and do it. Uh, and then I saw that last question come in. I'd say uh, what I would say is line hall still in that four to four and a half range, but most of the uh, you know close to five multiple businesses we see are in the line hall side. Um, they do still happen, and you know there's still plenty of PND operations that are in that four point five to five range. But I'd say more of those higher multiples happen on the line hall side. So yeah, so that's it. Oh, one more. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> so, uh, so that is it. Thanks so much for joining us this week. Again, hopefully we will see you in San Diego tonight. Uh, other than that, we will see you next week for our next webinar. And thanks everybody for joining us again. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.